Hello people and welcome back to another episode of Jed Skeptic. Tonight I'm going to read you a book. Well, I'm going to read the beginning, the intro, and maybe the preface. But this book kind of ties in with my, my research into the Lost Tribes and how the Lost Tribes could be Celtic, not Jewish, um, and how the Bible is possibly British origins. Uh, the whole of Christianity could be British origins. To me, the Romans entered Britain Hellenistic and left Britain Christian. Um, I think Britain has its Christian roots and Celtic Christianity. Um, I think the names have changed over time. The Romans obviously changed things. But I think it's the, 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 the beginnings of Christianity. It must have began in Western Europe either Britain or France. Anyway, you can check back on my videos, I've done lots of research into it, tying the new covenant in Britain, Jerusalem could be in Britain, the new Jerusalem. Uh, there's so many, so, so many clues to point you towards, but this book is another clue and thanks to a subscriber who forwarded me this book. Um, and it looks very interesting, I've had a quick sort of scan through it and um, it kind of be it's, it seems to be hitting on the same notes that I'm I'm seeing as well. Um, so without further ado, let's have a look at this book. I was looking at this map earlier, quite interesting, and it's the old. I, ca I can't spin it around, unfortunately, but you can see here that this is Europe. There's Britain, the bottom left, um, the Scandinavian countries there. But it's called the map of Kati or Hittite, Kasi and Barat place names in Phoenician colonies in Mediterranean and Northwest East Europe. And you can see here this this region here, Scythia, and this is a big part to play in the the history of the Celts, the tribes, because I do I do I do think the Celtic culture developed in the West. Maybe the people. Uh, the Celtic people were Indo-Europeans came from this area in Scythia, but I think the Celtic culture developed in the West. They weren't, I don't think there were Celts in Scythia. I think the Celtic origin, they have the origins in Scythia, but I think over time the culture developed in the Celtic culture with a language as well in Britain and possibly moved back through again. Anyway, this is an interesting map to have a look at. And the book is called Ireland, Land of the Pharaohs, The Quest for Our Atlantean Legacy. And it's by Andrew Power. And I listened to a podcast with these guys and interesting stuff, the Battle of the Boyne. They've got some interesting takes on history. And that's what I'm all about, guys. I'm all about the, the alternative history because we all know the powers that be, the elites. Um, they've obviously manipulated history to suit them. Um, so this book is dedicated to the memory of my mother and father and to all those who are descended from Scots-Irish. So if you're Scots-Irish, you'll find this book very interesting. This is Map of Ancient Europe shown Scotia, Ireland. So here you see guys, this is Ireland and it's called Scotia. And this is where the, the Scottish people have their origins, in, in Ireland. The Irish and the Scots are the, practically the same people. So there's the contents. I'll probably just skip the acknowledgements, guys. I'll just move straight on to the, the, the preface and the intro. And then I might even do The Quest Begins. Anyway, there's quite a few illustrations as well. We've got the Khazar map, the Scythian map, the course of the River Boyne compared to that of the Milky Way. Oh, the topography of the River Boyne and Nile compared. The Elgin Stone, Giza is centre of the world's landmass. The Stone of Scone being toasted by the Scottish Knights Templar. The position of the armies at the commencement of the ritual battle. Isis with the child, Horus, widow and child. Sky map, the scene at 4am and at 8am. Sky map, the scene at 12 noon and at 10.15pm. Portrayal of the constellations of Moniceras and Canis Minor. Sorry about the pronunci pronunciation of certain words and names. Um, 
It's not every day you say these words. William mounted on his horse, sky map of the constellations represented in the British coat of arms. The British coat of arms. Oh, there's, there's much more. Red Hand of Ulster, Red Hand, Israeli flags flying on main thoroughfare in Belfast, Masonic Banner Belfast, Ark of the Co Covenant, Masonic Headquarters Dublin, Rep representation of Giants Bolden, Cromlech, Giants Ring Belfast with Cromlech in the centre, Giants Causeway on the north coast, Talca, Mac and Mummy, Giant Boulder found near Douth, uh, Lion Monument at Waterloo. So much here guys, so much. I'll just scroll down slowly so you, you can pause it and have a look yourself. Um, but very interesting book. Um, these are the acknowledgements. Just a lot of names. So I'll begin with the, the preface. A note to the reader. The following narrative is an account of an incredible adventure that began some 20 years ago whilst I stood in front of one of the magnificent cairns, New Grange, in the Boyne Valley, Ireland. It is what I call Miss Story, which is not meant to be an academic thesis on history, or to echo, echo Velosky, was not written for those who swear by the verba magistry, the holiness of their school wisdom, and they may debate it without reading it as well. There has been no deliberate intention to disparage anyone's sincere held beliefs, so if, here and there, that appears to be the case. Know that it was not the objective. However, it was and is my purpose to poke the sleeping dragon of unquestioned thoughts and feelings. This is really a welcome task and can be precarious at the best of times, more so when it touches on the history of a schism such as that within Irish society. Within mystery, there are many ideas that the reader may find uncomfortable. Therefore, if you are content with the concepts you hold about life, are happy in your comfort zone, and your world view is settled, the story ends. You wake up in your bed and you believe whatever you want to believe. The goal of my story, ultimately surpassed, was to discover the origins of the race that built the magnificent structures at Brun na Boyne and what the connections were, if any, to a famous European battle that took place there in the 17th century. I accomplished this by playing devil's advocate with traditional history. Doing this proved to me history isn't as valid as most of us automatically assume and it certainly didn't have the answer to my historical conundrums. Trying to find out why it didn't have the answer led me to the secretive cabal of elites who still, I discovered, intentionally manipulate history to create an illusion, a prison for our minds, that we naturally believe to be reality. However, there have been brave souls throughout the ages, Akhenaten, Buddha, Jesus, amongst others who, have I, who I have named collectively as masters of the mystery schools that have opposed these hidden elites and tried to educate us about the illusion. So, you want to stay in Wonderland and discover what the Matrix is? Well, your attitude should be one of stringent discernment because what you will read here will test your credulity to its utmost and at some time during your quest, you may have the virtual experience of tumbling down the rabbit hole into an alternate reality. In this reality, you may well glimpse the truth, which is that you have been in an invisible prison all of your life. This re revelation leads to the path of freedom and the realisation of your true self. Eternal truth needs a human language that alters with the spirit of the times. Carl Jung When a myth is shared by a large number of people, it becomes a reality. Lawrence Blair so, that was a preface, or that was, in, uh, aye, that was a preface, this is the introduction. One of the saddest lessons of history is this, if we have been bamboozled long enough, we tend to reject any evidence of the bamboozle, we're no longer interested in finding out the truth. The bamboozle has captured us, it's simply too painful to acknowledge, even to ourselves, that we have been so credulous. Once again, Carl Sagan. Oh, it was young before, eh? Not Sagan. Carl Sagan. Ireland, land of the pharaohs. When the meaning of an encoded geographical cipher discovered in Ireland is unravelled, you will realise this assertion is based on fact. 
You will come to understand how 20 years of group research and an unexpected treasure trail of clues led to the solving of an incredible riddle. That is, did an ancient Egyptian ritual take place in Ireland at the end of the 17th century? Finding the answer to this conundrum will constitute a major part of our investigations in this book. Other findings, just as startling, will expose an account of history that could turn the status quo on its head. Is it true? Will it be believable? Ah, there's the rub. You will have to judge for yourself if traditional facts on which the story is based are valid within a new context. As you will discover, the sequence of events that led to some astonishing conclusions begins about 300 years ago when an English king, a Dutch prince and their multinational armies rendezvoused on the banks of the Boyne River on the ancient island of Ireland. This river, which rises at the well of the Blessed Trinity and is named in honour of the Irish goddess Boan, meanders majestically through the ancient land of Bruna Boyne and across the valley of the Irish kings before emptying into the sea at Drogheda doorway to the Boyne Valley and home to a vast array of ancient monuments. It is in Drogheda we encounter the first of the many anomalies associated with this mysterious valley because the symbols of the medieval Christian town are the Islamic star and crescent. The star represents Sirius, the morning star, or star of the east, and the crescent is that of the planet Venus. The colour associated with Venus is green, hence the green of Ireland. These symbols are found within its coat of arms deriving from those of King John, who in 1210 gave the town its first charter. It was within this picturesque location at the bend of the Boyne that the aforementioned characters participated in an arcane event which was to shape world events for hundreds of years afterwards and had profound consequences for Western civilization. Over three centuries later, this confrontation still arouses passionate debate and feelings and we have come to view it mistakenly as solely a religious battle. Today it is celebrated globally, from the northern territories of Canada to the antipodes in the deep southern hemisphere, from Perth in Scotland to Perth in Australia, from Belfast in the north of Ireland, through Africa to Belfast in the south island of New Zealand. What, you may ask, was so special about this battle, described in an anonymous pamphlet entitled A Light to the Blind, republished in 1892 as a Jacobite narrative of the war in Ireland? as a skirmish in passing, that it achieved such eminence? Was there something more meaningful to the celebrated event than just a religious battle? Indeed, was our subsequent view the result of some intentional manipulation surrounding it? To release this mystery, we must dig through many layers of disinformation. In doing this, we discover the astonishing truth that something much more significant and profound took place at Bruna Boyne than anyone has so far come anywhere near close to deciphering. What really happened and what it means will now be exposed to the light of day for the first time ever. Initial clues that revealed a corn cornucopia of knowledge about our hidden history were disco discovered cryptically encoded in the mystical landscape of Bruna Boyne and the dramatic events that took place there. Today, that enigmat enigmatic encounter is commonly recognised as a decisive battle for three crowns of Ireland, Scotland and England. However, my research uncovered overwhelming evidence that led to a totally different understanding of the symbolic battle. In fact, as accompanying evidence confirms, it was what it was supposed to be, a reenactment of an ancient ritual battle, concealing surprising details about the ancient Britons, the race of the Scots-Irish, and Occidental history. Hmm. The principal performers in this ritual drama were the above-mentioned royal scions, they were William, a prince of the Dutch House of Orange, de facto King of England, who ru ruled jointly with Mary, his Stuart wife, who was a lawful claimant to the throne, and James II, erstwhile Stuart King of Britain and Ireland. They were destined to meet in the Boyne Valley to participate in this extraordinary ritual battle, a landscape to which is, was inextricably linked for the reasons that will be developed as our explorations proceed. Decoding the raison d'etre of the previously mentioned battle uncovers the legend of a lost race that has been, for the most part, erased from a conscious memory. The famous Russian explorer, mystic and artist, Nicholas Rorich, mused about this race when he wrote, So before the eyes of history has come a nation, from whence is unknown, 
nor is it known how it scattered and disappeared without a trace. Our journey follows in the footprints of this race to discover how, and as importantly, why they traversed the globe, and where exactly their epic trek took them after leaving the ancient land of Bruna Boyne, in reality an ancient island that long predates Ireland, and their pagan homeland of Emain, see chapter 3. At the beginning of our narrative we find them fleeing from a catastrophe that devastated their island to what we know today as the northern grasslands of Europe. That stretched from the lower Danube River eastwards along one of the side of the Black Sea, where they congregated with a small number of survivors from other provinces of their ancient island. Traces of their diaspora throughout Europe, Asia Minor and North Africa can be found in the numerous clues they left carved in stone in the countries where they sojourned. In many cases, remnants settled to found new nations and races and ultimately became known to modern historians as Indo-Europeans. The tribes of this proto-European race that inhabited the eastern area of the northern grassland, stretching from the lower Danube River eastwards along one side of the Black Sea through southern Russia and into Asia, are known as Aryan. This group of tribes eventually divided into separate races as the mystery teachings confirm. About 1800 BC, these Aryan tribes divided and became two separate peoples. The eastern group descended into India. In their books, which we call the Vedas, and which are written in Sanskrit, there are echoes of the former unity. In other words, before the division of the eastern line of the Aryans, the other group, after the separation, also retained the name Aryan, but using the form Iran. These people pushed westwards and southward into the mountains. This continuing line of tribes was the formation of such people in Asia Minor as the Hittites, the Phrygians, the Scythians, Armenians, Medes, Persians and Aryans. The inner circle of the eastern tribes that journeyed into India continued their travels into the Himalayan mountains as far south as Tibet, never to return. Evidence that a mysterious northern people travelled deep into Asia is found in a desert-like region of China called the Taran Basin a remarkable archaeological find was brought to the attention of the world in 1994. This discovery was intriguing. 4,000-year-old tartan-clad talca Makin mummies who were Celtic Aryan in appearance. Elizabeth Wayland Barber records the following in her book The Mummies of the Umar Urum Urumqi. When the earliest of these Central Asian corpses nestled into the sands of the Taran Basin about 2000 BC, or a little after, the pyramids of Egypt had already stood for half a millennium, but the best known pharaohs, Ramesses II and King Tut, Tutankhamun, were rather more than 500 years into the future. What Professor Mayer recognised there stunned him. The mummies appeared to be neither Chinese nor Mon Mongoloid in facial type. They looked in fact distinctively Caucasian, with high bridged noses, deep round eye sockets, fair hair, and on the men, heavy beards. Even more difficult to determine what language or languages might have these people have spoken. Nearly a century before, scholars had discovered in the same area a variety of documents dating from the first millennium AD and written in a now extinct language known as Tocharian. To everyone's surprise, Tocharian turned out to be related to the Indo-European tongues spoken in most of Europe, including English, Latin and Greek, and in parts of the Near East, including Persian and Sanskrit. These far-flung Tocharian speakers, therefore, must have penetrated into Central Asia from the West, but when or how they got there, no one knew. The finding of groups of Caucasoid mummies in the Tarim Basin that clearly antedated the Tocharian inscription thus held out hope to the linguists that their puzzle might finally be solved. Barber, an expert on prehistoric textiles, draws parallels between the weaving techniques of Japan and the Middle East, particularly Persia, but also more provocatively with those of the Celtic peoples of Ireland and Scotland. She, according to one reviewer, speculates that these mysterious people were peripatetic herders and oasis hoppers of the Indo-European origin, possibly Turkic speaking, and she establishes links between the Caucasian people of this remote Chinese region and the ancient Celts. Perhaps the most startling find was their clothing. Finely woven and brightly coloured woolen garments made of very high quality raw materials adorned the bodies. Trousers, felt stockings, pointed hats, craftings, the weaving techniques used were reminiscent of the ancient Celtic weaving of Northwest Europe, 
with twill and tartan patterns used intensively rich colours including reds, yellows and blues. The discovery of cowrie shells from the sea not naturally found within thousands of miles of this desert area indicates that these people must have engaged in long distance trade. Who were they? Where did they originate? And how did they come to be prospering in China at this time? In light of this remarkable discovery, while well, far from being the only ev evidence that point towards a displaced prehistoric northern race and their travels, it was now safe to build on my hypothesis that a race from northwestern Europe migrated to North Africa and Asia. What disaster compelled them to travel to the farthest outposts of the world? What momentous event forced them to journey over such vast distances from their homeland? Suppositions put forward over the years, which have included a catastrophe as the cause for this great exodus, have been repressed, ridiculed and riled against by establishment academics, as were the diverse researchers who we will encounter on our voyage of discovery who attempted to uncover this remarkable story. An objective examination of the catastrophe theory will show with some certitude that an earth-shattering event scattered this race across the face of the earth and left a blot on the psyche of humanity that is recorded universally in myths and legends. More contra controversial is my discovery that this exodus is colourfully recreated every year in a Mardi Gras type festival in Belfast, the capital city of modern day Ulster, Northern Ireland. My in investigations uncovered overwhelming, albeit mostly circumstantial, evidence of a global cataclysm caused by an impacting comet or comets, which approximates the date for the biblical flood given as around 2350 BCE. Ancient Chinese tradition also tells of a global deluge around 2300 BCE. We don't have to look back too many years to find evidence that a comet can cause widespread devastation when it collides with the Earth. In 1908, a small comet struck the Tunguska region of Siberia, resulting in the flattening of thousands of square miles of forest. If this comet hit a few hours later, millions of lives could have been lost as it would probably have devastated large population centres of Europe. An even more contemporary example was the Shoemaker-Levi comet that collided with Jupiter in 1994. Picking up the trail of the displaced Aryan tribes again, we discover the core of the eastern branch, having detached themselves from the parent body, trekked deeper into Asia and the Him Himalayas to pursue their own adventures. They maintain contact from time to time with those they left behind, although in ways that does not lend itself to understanding by the uninitiated or cynical mind. Turning our attention to those tribes of the western branch of this race, who eventually became known as Israelis, we find them living in a harsh nomadic existence before finally migrating in a successive waves in search for their ancient homeland in the northern Atlantic Ocean. We will observe these Israelis, who were probably in effect Egyptian tribes, gradually metamorphose into those Scots-Irish race as they return via Scythia. Greece and Spain to their beloved island that had long since been shattered into smaller islets. They, re they recorded their travels for posterity in keeping with a degree of consciousness. Unfortunately, these accounts, being of the oral tradition, were later deciphered by a vastly different mindset and ultimately evolved into myths and legends. Some of these myths were taken out of context and used to perpetuate a deception that unsurped our sovereign history and has held our minds captive for centuries. An example of these machinations is found in Egyptologist Lorraine Evans' book Kingdom of the Ark, the startling story of how the ancient British race is descended from the pharaohs, referring to the suppressed links between Egypt and Britain. Lorraine alleges, This was one of the greatest academic conspiracies of modern times. However, thanks to the efforts of the authentic mystery schools, the true history of mankind was preserved, but kept from the gaze of the uninitiated until the time was right for it to be safely unveiled. It is my belief that we now have arrived at that moment in time. As our investigation continues, we will discover that we have been living under a massive deception about our ancestry, our history and who we are. Neo, the hero of the film Matrix, referring to his personal history, include, concludes, It never happened. It was all a deception. Perhaps we should bear this in mind when investigating our racial history, which metaphorically never happened and certainly not in the way presented to us. This story will challenge these manipulations and in a small way contribute to the pioneering research that is surfacing at its crucial time for our civilization. 
a multi-layered mythological story that has been manip manipulated into a factual record of a civil war between opposing branches of the Scots-Irish race will be deconstructed and then reconstructed in its proper context to demonstrate how this deception works. Because of the, the, this particular deceit, we, in Ireland, have been left with a legacy of death and destruction. In effect, a 300-year civil war that has clouded our incredible and noble identity. What has kept us sane throughout this entire facade is our dark sense of humour, our uniqueness. As the following poem illustrates, it is by the beloved Irish camp comedian James Young, and it is called The History Lesson. An English friend of mine insightfully observed this paradox on her first trip to Ireland. The people, she observed, seem a strange mix, violent and quite magical. A Dutchman called William and an Englishman, King James, fell out and started feuding and called each other names. It was for the throne of England, but for some reason not quite clear, they came across to Ireland to do their fighting here. They had Scarsfield, they had Scomburg, they had horse and foot and guns, and they landed up at Carrick with a thousand lambeg drums. They had lots of Dutch and Frenchmen and battalions and platoons, of Russians and of Prussians and Bulgarian dragoons, and they politely asked the Irish if they can kindly liked to join, and the whole affair was settled at the Battle of the Boyne. Then William went to London and James went off to France, and the whole caboose left Ireland without a backwards glance. And the poor abandoned Irish said goodbye to King and Prince and went on with the fighting and they have been there, been at it ever since. This satir satirical verse helps to set the scene for the strange mix of confusion and, by its nature, incongruity that has been generated in the story. Retrospection will show that this poem is accurate in several respects. My personal version of the extraordinary history of the Scots-Irish, that is Western history, the ritual battle of the arena where it took place completely contradicts the orthodox views of history. As far as the ritual battle is concerned, we will find that sectarian aspects were deliberately manipulated in such a way that prevents large sections of society from taking a deeper interest in this great occult event. In effect, the ritual battle was demonised, an old trick used to destroy anything that threatens the status quo. Must people going on about their day-to-day -day routine happily accept the authorised versions of history, since they have no reason to believe otherwise, but wise men investigate what the rest take for granted? The essence of the orthodox story and the techniques that were used to manipulate society into accepting it applies to the histories of all Western countries, which leads us to the discovery that there is a global system in place that, can, that the corporate establishment wants to keep intact for its own nefarious agendas, Investigative researcher James Dougherty helps to conceptualise this for us. To bridge the gap between conspiracy and history, that is, to respond to the charge that is ludicrous to claim that history is a conspiracy, we postulate that the concept of power organisms, which once programmed by their founders, take on a life of their own. A wide variety of power organisms, suborganisms and supraorganisms exist. Michael Haupt expands this on his website and where he gives two fundamental ways to view history. There are catastrophic or accidental history and conspiratorial. In catastrophic or accidental history, according to Michael, we are led to believe that the historical events such as wars and revolutions were the direct result of some sudden or surprising event, while the catastrophic view is accurate for weather, volcanoes and earthquakes it does not always provide a realistic view of humanity and events influenced by man. In contrast, conspiratorial history studies that part of history that is a product of man's planning. In conspiratorial history we are led to believe that events such as wars and revolutions are the result of planned events, while the conspiratorial view is not accurate for weather, volcanoes and earthquakes. It is a realistic and accurate view of the interrelationships of man and nations. Since the planning for most of these events was done in secret, we use the term conspiratorial history, that is, the history is the result of plans constructed in secret, which by definition is a conspiracy. Michael goes on to say that he believes the current world events are the result of an organised campaign by an elite group of unseen and widely unknown world leaders. We will investigate the so-called global conspiracy and discover some surprising evidence in Chapter 2. 
definite answers to the prehistory that spawned Western civilizations are not confined to any one country, but within some can be found important keys, and you will discover for yourself that at least one of these major keys is found concealed in the landscape of the mystical land of Bruna Boyne. To begin to understand how we could have been deceived for so long, and so completely, is essential to loosen the Gordian knot of traditional history. This can only be co accomplished by slicing through the disinformation we have been fed about our origins and its chronology. It is only then we can become aware of the portal or stargate which has been concealed for hundreds of years that will ultimately lead us to a different reality, to a mystical land that was once inhabited by a technically advanced race, and to our true genesis. The question then has to be asked, who is responsible for this disinformation we have been fed about history and society, and more importantly, why? We have already encountered a couple of possible answers to this anomaly, but is also, in part, self-administered through general apathy regarding our origins. If we don't ask why, we remain powerless to change anything. Proof of a powerful parasitical elite will be presented who influences our day-to-day -day lives, as Michael Hopt indicates above, whilst concealing themselves backstage of what we believe to be reality. We will discover that what we call reality is not what we think it is, it is actually what we think, we can't think it is. There is a natural barrier in our minds that attempts to reject the possibility there could be mysterious to the uninitiated initiated forces that have achieved control of society through the manipulation of our beliefs and history. I want to own nothing and control everything. John Davidson Rockefeller I, 1839-1937, to 1937, was reported to have said, serving us as an insight into the mindset of this powerful plutocracy. In the course of our investigations, you will come to a deeper understanding of this aphorism. Finally, we will arrive at a comprehension of why the almost forgotten race that lived in the environs of Bruna Boyne has been largely neglected by both mainstream and most alternative historical researchers. Explanations given in an attempt to respond to the undoubted scepticism, this story will provoke many not to be reassuring. Some people will find it difficult to integrate the more radical aspects of these concepts. However, all that is asked is that you keep an open mind until you have examined the complete story. You may be rewarded with a richer view of life than you have had heretofore. Originally, my quest was intended to accomplish a cherished personal goal, because running alongside this extraordinary account of history is the story of a search for the truth of my ancestry and a long-held ambition the discovery of a common identity for the Ulster Irish people. Not in my wildest dreams was there any notion that the historical global story, which finally materialised, would be so radically different from the received view of history that traditional education has indoctrinated into our naive minds. Neither was there any prior mental preparation for the incredible shattering attack on my view of society, or, more surprisingly, the many benefits that flowed from my journey of discovery. What if? What if? The thought crept up on me. My story had a similar dramatic effect on a wider audience and the preconceived notions of history as it had on me. Would it change long-held destructive beliefs to revive primordial race memories, to reunite our dysfunctional Scots-Irish family? As you will discover, this story sets the Scots-Irish nation in an international context. There was, now, coming from somewhere deep within my psyche, an overwhelming and an initially unwelcome urge to continue exploring and to make whatever discoveries emerge freely available, in the hope that they would generate enough empathy to encourage people to turn traditional his story into their own story. To publish my findings was not the primary reason of my research, although it was becoming increasingly obvious that this was meant to happen, which for me, having no formal literary training, was a little intimidating to say the least. It was my fate, and in retrospect, good fortune to be born into an area in Loyalist Belfast where our honestly held biases run deep. You may come to understand how uncomfortable it was for me to commit these unique and controversial concepts to paper. Even as my research unfolded and the subsequent story began to emerge, it felt like a betrayal of my culture and its religion. But the freedom it gave me to discover a whole new lifestyle was refreshing. Sometimes my courage would wane, but finally the truth dawned on me to reinvigorate my re resolve. My story was unveiling a global and historical dimension to the Scots-Irish race, which had heretofore been lacking. Since 
we do take our history very seriously in my neck of the woods, it was to be hoped that these unusual constructs would whet the appetite of those who were ready to accept new concepts about themselves and their racial history. Hopefully there will be people within this group that are in a better position than me to make a difference to how we, as a civilization, evolve. It appears to me the reason for the renewed interest in history at this time is because we are struggling to find our identity, as is all humanity. A good example of this is the Irish Ulster Protestants or the Red Branch of the Scots-Irish Nation, who in any analysis have been manoeuvred into a position where they feel like strangers in a strange land. However, given a sympathetic hearing, these unique concepts could give us clues to a lost identity and demonstrate that they already inhibit, with all other religions, their original island. This story may prove uncomfortable with some of the more extreme nationalists or nationalists of any hue of that matter, and will certainly not fit in with their xenophobic view of Irish history that tends to keep people divided, an argument that will be revisited. If the opposing sides of the, this purportedly political religious conflict would stand back and take a broader look at their own de facto history and traditions, they would come to the realisation it is not what they have been brought up to be, lie, v, believe. Etymology, the study of root and meaning of words, will be a valuable tool in our task of unearthing our hidden history. Primarily this story, this yarn, as we say in Ireland, began with a question that led to another and eventually developed into a chronicle of this remarkable history of Western civilization that, if true, will heal our past and lead us to an exciting and prosperous future. This was well expressed in an interview on BBC Radio 4 programme. The interviewee, in answer to a question about the importance of history, said, We study the past to the present so we can change the future. Regardless of the religious or racial differences in our world, most people, if they approach this narrative with a discerning mind, could be convinced that we are all inheritors of an ancient heritage far beyond anything we could ever imagine. However, until we realise our history and that our view of reality is not what it appears, this cannot be emphasised too often. Our future will find us continue to plunge into a black hole of uncertainty and possible annihilation of conscious life on planet Earth. What will be revealed to us if we honestly reconsider our individual view of traditional history and so-called reality with these radical concepts in mind is the fact that we, the Scots-Irish British, along with the rest of Western civilization, have our roots in a single antediluvian race, that we are the progenitors of the Aryan, Celtic, Phoenician, Egyptian races, a word for the more ferocious minded, there is no contradiction in saying we are Scots, Irish, British, since these facts have been manipulated and our ancestry demonised throughout through our willingness to believe whatever truths we have been presented with. In a sense, we are more comfortable with this because we don't need to employ the effort to think for ourselves. Sadly, this has the effect of keeping us ignorant of our true relationship with each other and our shared genesis and, as Adolf Hitler allegedly remarked, what luck for rulers men do not think. The people of Ireland have forgotten that as a race we are descendants of the same ancient family, albeit different branches, which have travelled throughout time and the world together. Because we have forgotten or are ignorant of this fact, the, ma the manipulation we have suffered was easily implemented. Because this research was not intended to be an academic hypothesis, a broad brush was used to paint this individual account of Western history. It is the result of a deep interest in the history of my people that turned into a voyage of discovery, adventure and excitement. My hope is that after you have shared in my story, it will encourage you to discover more about our ancient history, because only the surface has been scratched here, especially as far as the British Isles is concerned. Nevertheless, with it came the realisation that within the minutiae of historical writings, we tend to lose our way and the manipulators have free reign. It is a truism that the devil is in the detail. Nomadic tribes have met and warred, and out of these clashes have evolved new tribes, races and nations, the consequences being that origins become lost and result in chaos. Legends about ancient peoples and their lands have been regurgitated to the point of perplexity, and as each historian adds to the confusion, chronological records become unreliable. For a clearer picture of this, let us sit on a history lesson given by one of the mis mystery schools. The instructor begins. As we review history, we observe eras that appear to contrast severely, just as though one has sharply 
terminated when the other began. What are, we are observing, however, are the major developments that stand out in prominence. What lies between such extremes in history and has caused the tr transition may be a whole series of minor incidences. Either history has no record of them or they were not emphasised and as a result the student is not aware of them. If you will carefully review your personal memories you will realise that the interests that dominated at some time in the past did not really emerge suddenly. There was a gradual trend, a series of lesser influences which resulted in the development of your final interest. Such may have been a word said by someone, a book that you read or a play which you may have seen. Though each was but a minor emotional or intellectual stimulus, these influences did have existence. They pyramided in their accumulative effect to make certain changes which you now think of as landmarks in the history of your life. When discovered, it is these landmarks, this golden thread of genetic fingerprint which runs through history that reveals our, the true origins of Occidental civilization, and will compromise much of our study. Most of my story seemed to me at the outset to be unique and somewhat far-fetched, but as my research developed, this was to prove untrue. Astonishingly, most of my theories and discoveries could be found elsewhere and are, in fact, quite common. There is no new thing under the sun. There was also repressed material that required diligent research and digging to unearth. Nevertheless, you will find there are discoveries in this narrative that have never been made known heretofore, to the best of my knowledge. For example, the surprising origins of the symbols found in the British coat of arms will be revealed and where they were displayed and could be clearly seen on the day of the ritual battle. There will be robust evidence presented that an ancient, sophisticated race who inhabited Ireland knew about genetics as well as being expert astronomers and cartographers who had the knowledge to map the surface of the moon. And of course, the most unique aspects of my story demonstrate that the events in the Boyne Valley in 1690 point to an Egyptian ritual battle. This ritual battle was to reveal and conceal in symbolic form the origins of Western civilization in what is known today as the island of Ireland, but in prehistory known by a different name. If this really is the case, and Ireland is a womb of civilization, and it follows that Ireland should be the true location of Noah's Ark. Not only will a plausible theory be presented to show this to be the case, but the Ark will be identified and the site where it can be viewed for the first time in history. Because of the open-ended nature of this study, it leaves an opportunity for other more scholastic students of history to adopt and fill in details where they think worthwhile. The concepts presented here centrally deserve more research. My reward was an inner journey that resonates with the 19th century critic John Ruskin's remarks. The highest reward for a person's toil is not what they get for it, but what they become by it. This adage certainly applied to me personally, as it did to some others who accompanied me on this credible journey, as my voyage of discovery continued. So-called facts about history disintegrate in the light of new consciousness that is arising on planet Earth at this critical time for civilization. It startled me to think that if my research, this tale, or even in part true, it would necessitate a re-examination of the traditional history of Ireland, Western civilization, and indeed the origins of humanity. These thoughts fortified me, as my research turned out to be so mind-blowing, it was difficult to fathom the information that was bursting through the barriers of my mind that left me intellectual and spiritually naked and exhausted. What then would be the effect on others who would see this pioneering and potentially explosive research for the first time? It did not matter to me anymore. The point of no return had long passed, and anyway, the irony in my discovers was appealing to my paternal, inherited sense of humour. It seems neo. Fate is not without a sense of irony. Besides my utter rejection of the accepted view of history, this research changed my world view of our modern civilization completely. You will, perhaps over the next few chapters, come to the realisation that what we live in actually is the complete opposite of what a civilization should be. In fact, it has been identified through Dr. Wallace's discoveries, Neotech, as an anti-civilization or a controlled mental matrix. When the new con concepts that have been incorporated in this story begin to integrate with your existing knowledge of reality and your personal history, you will begin to feel a sense of excitement that may surprise you. Our journey necessitates trips along strange paths, and as we navigate these routes, doors will open to invite us in. These will lead, however, briefly to exhilarating new vi vistas of history, 
some of which will amaze you while others you will dismiss as ridiculous or far-fetched. But if these unfamiliar landscapes are approached with an inquiring spirit, you will discover that the world you inhabit is in fact an invisible prison for your mind. You may sho be shocked to, to discover you have not been as much in control of your life as you might like to think. Do you believe in fate, Neil? No. Why not? Because I don't like the idea I'm not in control, control of my life. That there is a controlling class who are in reality camouflaged criminals will become increasingly certain if you explore the references within the story with a question and attitude. Here is a taster of what is to come from one of the most radical minds of the 19th century. That the original robbers and holders of these lands in both England and Ireland with such accomplices as they have from time to time induced to join them have now for many hundreds of years constituted a conspiracy that is have organized themselves into what they call a government for the purpose of sustaining each other in the possession of all the lands they have seized and also for the purpose of plundering and enslaving all the descendants of those from which the lands were originally taken and for the still further purpose of plundering and enslaving as far as possible all other peoples in other parts of the world this conspiracy has existed in an organized form that is in the form of both state and church for many hundreds of years one last word of warning for those who are comfortable with their perception of society as it is. Read no further, take the blue pill, because there are dangerous concepts within this narrative that may, be, may upset and will certainly challenge your comfortable view of this world. For those that know there is something wrong and want to find out what it is, take the red pill, enjoy your journey. journey. As you step through the proverbial looking glass, your view of the world will inhabit will undoubtedly be transformed and you will never look at it the same way again. You will begin to grasp that the reality you live in is a bizarre upside down world by which by default is of our own making. Do you know what I am talking about? asked Morpheus. The Matrix, responds Neo. Do you want to know what the Matrix is? Then read on. So this is Ireland, land of the pharaohs and the footnotes. And I think this is possibly the beginning of chapter one. The quest begins. Sit down before, fat like a child, and be prepared to give up every preconceived notion. Follow humbly whenever, whatever a best nature leads, or you shall learn nothing. T. H. Huxley. Okay, guys. So, pretty, pretty exciting stuff so far, I've got to say. Even just the introduction is, it's a, it's a page turner, definitely. It's a page turner. So I'll probably do another one of these midweek next week. Uh, the quest begins. Ireland, land of the pharaohs. Okay, people, thanks for listening, and I'll see you again.